So uh, I'm going to turn it over to him. We're really glad to have you uh, with us. So please uh, join me in welcoming Carol. Hi, it's great to be here. Um, 20 years ago, I was sitting here. Uh, that means I'm likely 20 years older than you, which is slightly depressing, but um, I'm going to go over it pretty quickly. Um, I had the privilege of being the sixth employee, original general manager of a small company at the time called Lululemon Athletica, and took it from a million dollars in sales to $200 million in sales, and uh, participated in the IPO, and uh, subsequently founded a incubator accelerator uh, called Institute B for for-profit social impact corporations. Um, was involved with a bunch of financing for B corporations, social impact corporations, social enterprises, and then was the founding CEO of Kit and Ace. Um, uh, did that for two years. We went from zero to 68 stores in five countries, uh, $50 million run rate in about 18 months. And then uh, I was ejected uh, and uh, uh, became uh, an adjunct professor. I talked about all the wins and losses of the career on a regular basis. So. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. Thank you for coming. Uh, there's two kinds of professors. One is uh, an academic PhD that uh, does a lot of research and uh, talks with extreme uh, prowess on a certain subject and uh, very beneficial to your MBA. Uh, then there's people like me who are extremely non-academic and they let in occasionally in little spurts because otherwise we stir up the ecosystem. So uh, I'm that guy. I'm the adjunct professor that comes in and talks about all, all the years of, of, of running businesses. Uh, and uh, today's subject is pitch decks uh, and pitching for venture financing. I've had the privilege of being involved in about $300 million of transactions on both sides of the table. Um, and so I pitch regularly. Uh, I pitched last week. I'm starting another a $10 million raise in, in, a, in a couple of months, something that I enjoy doing. And the context of this lecture is, uh, as Michael mentioned, part of the course, uh, there's actually two courses, Bain 580B and 580C, called the Creative Destruction Lab. So the Creative Destruction Lab is a seed venture development program for massively scalable technology and science-based ventures. Okay, we take scientists out of the labs and uh, mix them with cashed out centimillionaire billionaire technology founders and MBA and BCom students uh, in a eight, uh, nine month objective based mentorship program. Okay, we're the second uh, of these uh, branches, started at the University of Toronto, Rotman School of Management, and had tremendous amount of success. In five years, uh, they actually uh, created $1.5 billion of equity value creation. Right? Tremendous amount of financing. And these are the ventures that are fundamentally going to change the world for the better. These are the ones that are going to cure cancer, are going to do some really fundamentally important things, riveting things, uh, and we get to be a part of that. So we brought this over uh, to UBC. Uh, it's called CDL West. And uh, it's, uh, it's a, a funky course, non-traditional course. Uh, for the MBAs, full-time MBAs, they participate in half of the sessions. Uh, and for the BCOMs, they get to be here the whole year because of the way the programming works. Okay? Uh, and so you, we actually embed students into live seed venture, uh, seed, seed level ventures. So. Um, they get to participate in the research, they get to participate in uh, actual value proposition creation for these ventures, okay? So, this lecture that I'm going to deliver is in the context of the Creative Destruction Lab, but because this is a sample lecture, it's not a typical uh, one of my lectures, okay? Usually, we do something called the flipped classroom which means that students do a whole bunch of pre-reading in advance in anticipation of coming to the lecture, and we hold our lectures down in the, in the design labs in the basement of David Lamb building, which is an interactive space, lots of white, whiteboards, uh, TV screens, and uh, it's three hours, Monday nights, uh, woven in, in between these C CDL sessions. And uh, 
uh, the students come prepared, and so it's more of an interactive conversation about the ventures that they have been embedded with. And we do venture selection, we, do, uh, we bring in venture capitalists, lawyers, project managers, technologists to be guest lecturers, and it's quite interactive. So in that context, I do this lecture, which I did just a couple of weeks ago, uh, called uh, Pitch, Pitch Decks and, uh, for Venture Financing. Okay. The other schools that are involved with the Creative Destruction Lab are the Haskane School of Business at the University of Calgary, uh, Ashes at University of Montreal in Montreal, and Dalhousie University in Halifax, as well as New York University. And so uh, that, so we get to basically interact with uh, universities across North America, and and we're growing. So this is what we are doing today. We're talking about whether or not ventures actually need to raise money, whether they should raise money. Uh, we're going to talk about product market fit. We're going to learn about lessons from the professionals on pitch decks. What are the venture capitalists saying in the valley and elsewhere? And when to break the rules. And I'll be presenting to you one of the pitch decks I've used to raise, uh, to oversubscribe my seed round of my latest company. And then we'll, we'll take questions. I also encourage you, despite being filmed, to be interactive. Okay, so if you have questions, if you want to stop me, if you want clarification, then please do so. Okay, I, I get how if you have an arts background, if you have a science background, that some of the terminology that I use, you, it might go over your head. Uh, and in the MBA context, you would come prepared because we will have given you advanced reading and, and learning in that context, and then we drill it home in this interactive environment. Okay, so please feel free to uh, raise your hand and interrupt at any point. All right. So, question number one. Do I need to raise money? The, the way to answer this question is really with a question. And that is, if you are an entrepreneur, you are entrepreneurial, and you want to start a venture, who do you want to be every day? Do you want to be the inventor, the product-focused individual? Do you want to be uh, the, uh, the hero founder, like a Steve Jobs, that basically can grow with an organization and, uh, and, and actually lead and mentor and develop and hire and fire and do a lot of the business elements? There's no right or wrong answer here, but the, the answer to the question, do I need to raise money, is, also, is often some element of self-reflection in terms of who do you want to be every day as an entrepreneur. Uh, most people haven't contemplated that. And so oftentimes when I'm interacting with entrepreneurs, especially science-based entrepreneurs, technologists, engineers, uh, people in life sciences, biomed tech, I ask them, who do you want to be? How, who are you most comfortable being on a daily basis? Are you comfortable in lab coat, you know, looking in a microscope? you know, really inventing, creating, you, you, you're good with your hands, or do you want to uh, be the person that calls up your partner late at night saying, you know, I need to take another loan against my mortgage uh, to pay my employees, and I have to decide this month if I'm going to pay uh, the Canadian Revenue Agency, my employees, or my, my landlord. Um, who am I going to pay? Because I can only pay one. Who am I going to pay? Do you want to be that person? Because that's the job of the CEO, all right? Have any of you fired anybody in your careers? Okay, a bunch of you, all right? No textbook can prepare you for that, right? Do you want to be that person? The reason I bring this up in the context of do I need to raise money is because who do you want to be every day? If you raise money, are you working for yourself or are you working for the people who are giving you money? Oftentimes, you are working for the people who are giving you money. You're reporting to a board of uh, directors. If you need more money, sometimes you are often so diluted from your capital, your ownership decreases so much that you actually don't even have power of decision making at the board level anymore as an entrepreneur. 
as a CEO. So who do you want to be? Right? In the context of who you want to be, you answer the question, do I need to raise money? And there's a lot of opportunities to raise money that are non-dilutive or don't take away your ownership in the, in the organization. You know, whether it's personal financing, it's things, money that you've saved, whether it's personal credit lines, you can borrow against certain assets and collateral. Uh, families and friends, they love giving you money. They love it. <laughs> they're so good at that. Yeah. Friends and family, right? They're the best people to ask. That should be number one. Next time, I'll put that number one. Uh, new, new opportunities for peer-to-peer -peer lending uh, are emerging. Certainly, there's a lot of blockchain technology coming out to really help with peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending. Uh, crowd, uh, crowdfunding, although 98% of crowdfunding opportunities are actually unsuccessful, those 2% get a lot of noise, and is a great opportunity to, to seek, um, seek funding. Microloans, vendor financing and purchase order financing, those are opportunities if you are inventory-based organization, you can lend against either future sales or your actual inventory. And uh, also using investments as collateral as well. Okay, so the question, the context here, before we talk about, well, yeah, I do want to sell part of my company and I do want to pitch, is really answer the question, who do I want to work for? And who's really in charge? And if I'm going to sell part of my company, am I prepared for the outcomes of that? Right? And the best part about this is no right or wrong answer. If you decide that who you want to be in the context of an entrepreneurial venture is that inventor, there's great opportunities for you in that context. Okay? You don't have to be the hero founder. There's no award for that. But self-awareness is critical in the context of being able to stand in front of people and pitch your venture, because they're going to ask you, who are you going to be in this? What is your team like? What are you good at? What are you bad at? That self-awareness is critical. And we cannot understate the merits of bootstrapping. Bootstrapping is doing whatever it takes by the lace of your boots to get by without raising any equity or, or selling any part of your company. The best way to raise money for your venture is to create revenues and create sales. Uh, we are blinded in the, the media with the dragon's den and shark tanks of the world where we think that raising money is what we need to do. And ultimately, the best thing you could do is create a company that generates so much revenue you don't need to raise money. But we want it fast, we want it now, we want to do it. Let's go, let's go, we gotta go fast, we gotta go fast. It's a double-edged sword. Okay, so self-awareness is key and critical in the context of this. So, we answered that question. Any questions on this before I move on? question. So you are raising money, you're putting yourself out there, you raise money, and then you you lose mm -hmm. all the money, yeah. and you go bankrupt. Yeah, yeah it sucks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, there, there's this, uh, it depends on your context and how you view failure, failure, right? Some people say there's winning and there's learning, right? Um, I've bankrupted a bunch of companies. And every time I bankrupted a company, I found a new way to do it. <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, it, I, 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 tell, I tell my kids they need to fail more. Um, because if you're going to be successful, uh, you need to learn to fail. Uh, again, uh, it happens all the time where it's a badge of honor to fail. 
but ultimately um, it's, it's a context of how you, who you are in the context of your failure with the people who have given your money. Right, because there's a lot of people who fail and uh, are, uh, deceive the investors or you know, maybe misdirect some funds and things like that. And those are the people who necessarily won't get refinanced the next time. Often people who are investing in seed venture financing or the, the earliest stage investment opportunities is the highest risk venture capital. They, they know that nine out of 10 times their money is gonna be failed, right? Um, and so they put it in the math. But um, one of these things, the context of why am I doing an MBA? What if you do your MBA and you can't get a job? It's a failure. Well, like most things uh, in humanity, your interaction with this MBA is in the, your, in the eyes of the beholder. If you come in thinking the MBA is going to give you a blank check to success, you're probably wrong. If you come in and say, this MBA is my next opportunity to do something uh, amazing with my career. You're most likely right. right? The, the actual context, though, is it's up to you. No one's handing you every, anything. You want to be a successful entre entrepreneur? You want to raise money? You better work harder than everyone else. And you better hustle, and you better have an attitude where if it's meant to be, it's up to me. Your interaction with your business, your interaction with your MBA is your perspective and how you view the world. Right. Am I going to use this as an opportunity to be great? Or am I going to, uh, so am I going to make my life happen? Or I'm going to let my life happen to me? If you come to this school thinking that there's a sense of entitlement because you got in and it's going to give you every step of the way of success, that's not the case. The people who are going to make your life and your business successful are the ones sitting in your chairs. Or the ones who haven't figured that out, it's you. You're going to do that. <laughs> right? No one's giving it to you. Right? So, you have to embrace failure. Product market fit. Lesson one of product market fit. You could have the best idea as an entrepreneur, but I promise you one thing, you are not alone. There's other people not only have had the idea, but they're actively working and they're likely venture financed. And so we hear from a lot of people that, oh, I have this great idea, no one's thought of it. Okay, so I, I like to bring up these maps. These are CB Insight maps. Uh, that um, show venture financed ventures in different categories. Uh, because uh, it, it takes about 30 seconds to Google one of these uh, and figure out that maybe we're not alone. Because even if specifically nobody has done what your idea is that you will be raising money for, there are incumbents in the space that people are currently using or there are substitutes. There's other opportunities to spend money and consume in the context of what you're building. So, food and beverage of the future. I got a great idea. Okay, it's probably thought of. Doesn't mean it's not worth doing. But lesson one, in terms of pitching your venture to investors, is understanding that you are not alone. I got some great mobile technology. I got some great infrastructure plays. Oh, there might be a couple of companies doing it. Uh, we call an investment uh, the hype cycle. If you haven't heard that, it's what's hype now? Everyone's talking about uh, blockchain and, and cryptocurrency and cannabis. Those are the, the, the hypest right now. But uh, in the last couple of years, there's a lot of investment going into uh, blockchain. Okay? What about crypto? Nobody's in, nobody has your idea for crypto. Oh, maybe they have your idea for crypto. Hmm. All right, again, this took 35 seconds to Google. We are not alone. What about my background, retail, retail technology? Nobody's thought of this cool idea that I have in retail. Oh, maybe they have.
beacon-based analytics and marketing. Most of us don't even know what that is, but look how much investment has gone in to that space. So what is it? Beacon-based analytics and marketing is uh, geo-targeted, so geo-targeted uh, uh, heat mapping and analytics. So basically, uh, the retail experience, if you walk in, anybody shop at Sephora? Okay, do you know that every inch of your movement from when you're six feet out of the store to anything that you do in the store is actually completely mapped? And that to 95% accuracy, they can identify your your demographic profile, and there's heat mapping, and they'll know if you're standing here versus you're standing here, right? And then if you uh, geo-target, that means that as you walk by, you get those annoying bzz, 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 and it's targeted to you. That's, that's that. Artificial intelligence, there's a couple people in the space. In fact, in Creative Destruction Lab, we have 125 artificial intelligence and deep learning ventures on an annual basis between three of our universities that are in our program. So Creative Destruction Lab is the largest <coughs> gathering of artificial intelligence venture firms in some seed venture development program in the world. And we embed students into those ventures. So, lesson one, you are not alone. Lesson two, no product market fit, no company. Okay, any people trained in uh, medicine here or, okay, so you, are you a physician? Okay, good. The last time I did this, uh, it didn't go well, so we're going to try again, all right? All right, all right, no pressure, but how do we know when a human is truly dead? Okay. I've done it for a while. So okay. Don't die. Don't die. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, we'll stay alive. We'll stay alive. We've got 30 minutes to get through here, yeah. and then we'll stay alive. Anyway, it's so the breathing and, and heart rate. Okay, so our heart stops, we die. Okay, we just simplify it just for the purpose of this yeah. conversation. We're business school. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I just like to get professional validation before I go into the next step. Yeah. Okay, we die when our heart stops. Okay, when is a business dead? No, no, you can survive a bit with no income. No cash flow. No transaction. No transactions. You can have no transactions, no but still be alive. No cash flow. No cash. No, can no cash flow. No cash. If no cash. No cash. Not Is that what you said? No, no cash. Not You're correct. Working capital. <laughs> if you have no money, you are you're dead as a company. Why? Because you can't pay for anything. But but you can have a whole pool of money and no transactions and no, you know, no no. Uh, no revenues coming in if you have enough money to sustain you, right? But as soon as your company runs out of money, your company is dead. So your cash is your heart rate, your heart beating breath thing. Right there. That's what he said. It's not going to be scientific, is it? No. Okay, okay. But, but it's an interesting, it might give you a little bit of material for you. Okay, so, okay good. So there's a concept of brain death. When the, the brain actually ceases to have that. Last time I did that, the brain the brain thing came up. <laughs> but but we're talking about business, yeah, no. and so I was ready to let it go. Exactly. But. My idea is that the company, I mean, yes, the, the blood, you could say if there's no cash and there's no heart rate, but if the entrepreneur still has the idea, and the idea still has some value in the sense of there is actually a market space there that could go in there, and someone has an idea that actually would fit. Yet, you know, so there's a potential for it. So there's there's brain activity even though there's no cash to turn. Right, it and so the company might be dormant in that case. But yeah, the thing is, if you have idea, no, uh, if you have no cash ability to pay anything, anybody conduct any marketing to do any kind of sales because you have no money to do anything, that's when you know your your company's done. That's when companies go bankrupt. Okay. Um, I gotta find a better way to do this. That was a lot of time for not making the point. The point. <laughs> <laughs> <You're right. laughs> the point is that you might not have cash, but that's not the reason why you're truly dead. 
Okay, just like your heart stopped, the chances are that, yes, everybody dies because their heart stopped and brain activity and all that stuff, but really it's because of cancer, you know, uh, cardiovascular disease. There's causes to have your heart stop. Just like there's causes to have you have no money. That's the point. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what is the major cause of having no money? It's that. No product market fit. That means you have a great technology, you have a great invention, you have a great idea, nobody cares and nobody's giving you money for it. Product market fit. So how do I think about product market fit? Let's do this uh, little exercise here. No, it's not an exercise, but that's it. So Clayton Christensen is a Harvard professor. And he did this analysis on milkshakes. Because what he noticed in his research was that in a suburb of Los Angeles, there was a huge spike of milkshake sales at 9 o'clock in the morning. And he thought it was weird that people were consuming milkshakes at 9 o'clock in the morning. And he asks himself, why? Why is this happening? So he framed it in such a way as what job is the customer hiring the milkshake to do? Right? Because there is transactions happening. There is product market fit. So what do you think it could be? Okay, it could be some element of caffeinated or sugar buzz. Yeah, what else? They're thick and they don't spill when you're driving. Okay, they're thick and they don't spill when you're, when driving. you're driving. Okay, very good. Easy to eat a breakfast sandwich. Yeah, breakfast sandwich, clumsy when you're driving. Yeah. Refreshing. It's hot outside. Yeah, so it's refreshing, it's hot outside. Okay, all those could be true. He found, really, it was more in line with people were bored driving, coffee went down too easy, their ability, they hired the milkshake to entertain them while they're on their morning commute. <laughs> That's why people hired the milkshake. That was their job. So as an entrepreneur, when we are establishing the foundation for a pitch to sell a company, we have to understand our value proposition, and that is, what is the customer hiring us to do? Hiring our product to do. And if we understand what job we're actually doing in the context of our product and service to the customer, then we have a real product market fit. Because if nobody is hiring your technology to do anything, your product to do anything, you do not have product market fit, and then we get into that uncomfortable conversation before. So yes, 70% or more of companies pretty much die because they can't answer simple questions. And so the way I like to ask this question is, what business are you really in? Let's think about it. We have some Starbucks here. What business is Starbucks in? Coffee. Coffee? Okay. What else? Business. Sorry? Customer service. Customer service in the customer service business? Place to hang out for a little while. And Place to hang out, right? So if you talk to Howard Schultz, the founder, he's in the, the business called The Third Place. Not work, not home, it's the third place to hang out. If you're in the coffee business, what do you sell? Coffee, right? If you're in the third place business, what do you sell? Places to stay. Pardon me? Places, Places to stay, to stay. Yeah. comfortable seats, Wi-Fi, wine, food, Experience. right? Clean bathrooms, great service, do you get it? What business are you in? You want to understand product market fit so that you can pitch your venture. You have to understand what your value proposition is to the paying customer. What business are you really in? Are you in the shovel business or are you in the hole business? Why do people buy shovels? Because they want a hole. If you gave them another opportunity for a hole, they would consider it. They don't want the shovel. They want the hole. What business are you in? But that fit changes, right? Pardon me? That fit changes. It can change. Starbucks was known for its coffees. Absolutely. It doesn't diminish the fact that they need to be best in the world at coffee. Right? So as one of the group of founders of Lululemon, 
What business is Lululemon in? Athleisure. Athleisure? Athleisure. Athleisure. Lifestyle? Hey, Lululemon's in the health business. They, they sell athleisure. But what they're truly passionate about, what they're creating, they basically before, when we started Lululemon, or when we were early days of Lululemon, performing yoga was, you know, you, you, it was done in loincloths. <laughs> or we, we said shrink and pink, right? People would like take men's clothes and dumb it down and make it pink for women, right? But it wasn't about the product. It was about the aspirational conversation called, how is the world up better because of us? Look how we impacting health in our communities. That's what people really bought. That's what the logo rep 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 represented to everybody. But what business are you in? How's the world that better because of you? We forget a lot of times in this business that humans are involved in business. But think about the, the watches you buy, the clothes you wear, the coffee you drink, the computer you have. Did I say the car you drive? How did you make those decisions? Were they rational decisions or were they emotional decisions? Most of us think we're rational, but studies have shown that 95% of us make emotional decisions and then post-rationalize and justify that after. Well, uh, $98 for black stretchy tights? That's, it's very good. Very good quality pants. Before Starbucks said you should pay $5 for coffee, we paid 25 cents for coffee. If you would have gone to a hundred customers and said, hey, I think you should pay $5 for coffee. What are they going to say? Are you crazy? <laughs> We're irrational people. Pitching your company is fundamentally irrational. Why? Because business is irrational. Stock markets are irrational. The valuation of your company is irrational. If, if this is incorrect, then why was Snapchat valued at a billion dollars with no revenue and no hope for revenue in the near future. There's no rational way to describe it. But there was a bidding war because people wanted it so that other people couldn't get it. Not rational. The more you contemplate that business is irrational, the more successful you're going to be in. Especially answering the question, what business are you in? So, when you're doing your MBA, you're going to see this. This is Osterwalder. We teach it in Com 101. We teach it in MBA. We teach it in Creative Instruction Lab. We teach it everywhere. That is, what is your value? What jobs do your customers need uh, performed? Okay? And we list those out. And then we ask the question, customers versus consumers. Are your customers also your consumers? Hmm. There, there is a difference. Yeah. So who could tell me a difference? Yeah. Uh, like you could be selling B to B, right? So your customer is actually the person who supplies the product to the person who eventually consumes it. Right. So if I'm a, a say Coca-Cola <laughs> bottler, my customer is somebody who gives me money, i.e. save on foods. But my consumer, the one I'm marketing to, is the one that is drinking it. Right? <laughs> Why does this matter? Why? Because you need to make a distinction in how you market and create an understanding and distinction between the jobs that a customer does versus the job that a consumer does. And many times you're catering to a consumer, but not a customer. Or you're catering to a customer, not a consumer. But you need to contemplate both. So we list the customer jobs. Then we ask a very important question called, what is missing? Not what is good, what is bad, what is missing. If you would have asked 100 people 100 years ago what was missing, they would have said, I really need a faster horse. That's what's missing. I need a faster horse. My horse is not fast enough for me to go from Philadelphia to Detroit. They wouldn't say cars. Huh? What's that? They wouldn't say cars. They, they wouldn't say cars. 
Exactly. They wouldn't say cars. There's something to contemplate. If you understand what is missing truly, you can create a true value proposition. The biggest pain that, that we see today is the pain called distance. You know, there's new technology happening in one of the ventures in Creative Destruction Lab in Toronto that would have this exact experience happen physically, emotionally, feeling like you're in this room except everybody's at home in their living room. They're solving a problem, what's missing, called distance. I need to solve this problem called distance. You know, using really good VR and other technologies. So, understanding what is missing means that you can solve a customer pain, means that you can establish some inherent value in the venture that you're trying to pitch. Right? Okay, then you say, what are the gains? What are the benefits we provide? How do we solve these pains? And what is the transaction? How do I make money? There's so many business plans that I get. It's a great killer idea. And I said, can you help me understand what the transaction is? And they said, what, what do you mean? I said, I would say, you, the customer has money. You would like to take some of that money in exchange for what you're doing. That's a transaction. How do we do it in the case of this business? And many people don't actually contemplate that because they're not thinking about it. That's what we do in MBA school, right? And that's how we help support these science-based technology entrepreneurs in a creative destruction lab, by helping them define their value proposition, a pricing model, these uh, financial val uh, valuations, modeling, things like that. And we have a lecture for each of those in the creative destruction lab course. Last question is who really cares? Who's your target customer? Do you even know? Most people want everyone to buy their stuff. But you need some courage, and your courage here and really refine it. It's extremely important. When you take your marketing classes, you'll understand why. And not everything to everyone. And something called the beachhead strategy. Beachhead strategy is a war term for a lot of reasons I don't understand. There's a lot of war terms in business. Uh, but beachhead is, first I take Juno Beach, then I take the village, then I take France. Okay? First I take yoga, then I take, you know, uh, running, and then I take all of athletics and athleisure. Right? Beachhead. First I take coffee, then I take the third place, and then I take everything in your wallet. <laughs> okay. Any questions on that? We're going to talk about pitching as I have to accelerate my conversation. Okay. We spend a lot of time creating our pitch decks. We talk about our businesses. And the average venture capitalist spends an average of three minutes and 44 seconds on them. It took, might take us months to create. The average VC spends three minutes and 44 seconds on them. We better be clear and effective and give them what they want if we're gonna get the next meeting. Right? So how do we do that? Well, we know that companies need an average of 40 investor meetings and 12 weeks to close around. And some say that's even conservative, but this is data out of the valley. Okay, so the way I say it is, when, if you want to really convey very quickly your value proposition, the benefit of investing in your company, one, you need to tell it to your mom. You need to pitch your mom. Uh, and mom in the sense if your mom's a CEO, you know, then, you know, then not that mom. I mean, find a mom that doesn't know anything about business and then pitch her. Because if you can actually convey to somebody who is financially not literate and business not literate why people should invest in your company and convey it in a simple fashion, then you're ready for investors. Because then you synthesize it to key points. You need to be prepared for the more elaborate stuff but you need to synthesize and uh, create, it, uh, it, create it really simple. Don't play with the numbers. What does that mean? That means don't make stuff up. I would use another word, but I'm on camera. <laughs> don't make stuff up, okay? There's two kinds of financial modeling, bottom up and top down. 
Okay, bottom up is how many coffees do I have to sell? How many pastries do I have to sell? How many wines do I have to sell to Starbucks uh, every day, uh, every week, every month, adjusted for seasonality, so that I achieve this dollar? That's bottom up. Okay, top down is the coffee market is $10 billion. In my neighborhood, in my city, it is $50 million. I'm going to take 3% of that. That's top down. Right? You don't play with your numbers because you need to have your financials validated from the bottom up and the top down in order to have some element of credibility with a prospective investor. We actually have a full financial modeling class for the Creative Destruction Lab. And of course, if you specialize in finance, uh, uh, then you, you actually do a lot of this stuff as well. Okay? And relationships matter. We talked about being humans before. I won't belabor it, but the bottom line is your relationship between your company and your customer, your branding relationship is an authentic relationship. Your relationship with your investor has to be an authentic relationship. Okay? We can't forget to be humans in business. We need to actually have authentic relationships. So how do I design a successful deck? Okay, so this is the pages in your deck that you need to have. Okay, so this is percentage of decks that include each of these. Okay, company purpose, problem, solution, why now, market size, product, team, business model, competition. Okay, you need to actually have a lot of those in your deck because these are the typical questions venture capitalists look at. Yep. A seed deck is like a business proposal? Yeah, so seed financing is the first stage of financing, an early stage. It's called seed level. Why? Because you're planting a seed of a future business. It's often the first round of financing. So when we, we, we make the emphasis to a seed deck, we're doing uh, four early stage investment opportunities. <coughs> Okay? As opposed to uh, what's called next is called Series A. Series A and then Series B, Series C are the transactions that come after you have established your product market fit, you're driving revenue and you need growth capital, you need money to grow your company. Seed is the highest risk and therefore you need to spend a lot of time <coughs> doing this. When, we were, when I was on the road show in 2005 pitching Lululemon, it ended up being a $225 million valuation, and we were in New York. Mm -hmm. we, we didn't have to spend so much time in terms of what the company did and why it was useful because we were generating a lot of revenue. So we didn't have to explain it like you would in a seed, in a seed round because that's future focused. What we had to do is, was there actually a real market? Nobody believed at the time in 2005 that yoga was an actual market. We had to convince them that it was over a $10 billion market opportunity. That's what it was back then. So the next slide really lets you think about how important these slides really are. Okay? So this is the time, page, view, and seconds. Okay? So in seconds, how much time are venture capitalists actually looking at your page in your deck? Number one, financials. Does that mean that they care about financials the most? Yeah? Not always. It's uh, often the most complex page to interpret. Right? It's extremely important. But oftentimes, remember the, well, I'll get to it. Okay, so the team. If you have a killer team, people really like forget about financials. Why? Because the team has done it before. Okay? Competition, why now? All the way down to problem and solution. Okay? Now I'd like to bring up the same point, and that is for problem and solution, oftentimes it may be only a paragraph or a sentence on the page, therefore it doesn't take a lot of time. Okay, so we need to interpret this data. But the point is, is that although you can see that VCs spend most time on financial slides, only 57% of successful pitch decks include this slide. I'm going to bring up my own pitch deck that I've used and just oversubscribed my seed venture round for my latest company. Uh, and it had 
no financial debt. I didn't have financials in the debt. Okay? So, and this is when to break the rules. We break the rules. In my big lectures, when we have more time, I go into two decks, but now I'm only going to go into one. Uh, Edelhard is my latest venture. It is a uh, rugby-inspired uh, performance tailoring company. You might notice I'm wearing a tracksuit right now. Oh, you didn't notice? <laughs> exactly, right? So, four-way stretch, taking super comfortable fabrics that you wear on the rugby field, except you were in a business environment. Reinventing the most comfortable suit in the world. Okay? So we just oversubscribed and sold. <coughs> Uh, uh, did a half million dollar raise and got $750,000 in just a few weeks. Okay, and this is my deck. Um, so you're your own consumer? I'm my own consumer. I am my own consumer. I'm a passionate advocate for change. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Men have a trouser problem. <laughs> and we're here to solve that. <laughs> I promised myself I wouldn't get emotional, but I can't promise that anymore. <laughs> because you brought it up. You brought it up. That's a bad I'm welling up. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now I know I can learn from you. Oh, okay. <laughs> the retail landscape is crumbling under the weight of the millennial generation and, dis and disruptive technology. By the way, the average pitch deck is 10, 10 to 20 pages. Okay. I'm a, I, I get to page 52 before I even talk about stuff. Okay, I, break, I break all the rules here. There's a rebellion against logos. Spending on luxury goods is decreasing at unprecedented rates. Malls are closing. E-commerce is a disruptive factor, and old school retail simply isn't working anymore. Look at all these companies that are, are crumbling. They're crumbling. It's so sad. All these companies are crumbling. Uh, Fifteen years ago, we were talking about vertical retail supplementing wholesale. Ten years ago, we declared e-commerce as the future. But today, omnichannel is the buzzword. Right? And it's ever adapting retail culture. Millennials have taken over. Consumer by baby, the consumer spending by baby boomers is spiraling downwards. But um, millennials are going to hit 1.5 trillion by 2020. We need to pay attention to this. Okay? And we know that millennials are changing how we consume. 55% of millennials have boycotted brands after learning of a company's irresponsible behavior. 56% would refuse to work at that company. And there's another statistic for graduating millennial MBAs. Let's say 90% of graduating millennial MBAs would take less money to work for a values-aligned organization. Okay? So they want to work and shop for companies that care about the world. And life isn't about having stuff. It's about making connections and living life fully, experiencing life. The sharing economy is real, and it's disrupting retail. Okay, so we talk about that. I've accelerated because you know we're we're out of time. How much time do I have? Okay, so brands no longer can stay static. Uh, mall chains old, old, dying. Okay, experience is the new luxury. Okay, and brands actually have to touch many aspects of a customer's life. And the best brands attach to a tribe of followers. Lululemon start with yoga, Rafa, cycling, Under Armour with football, Hook with performance fishing. Start with the beachhead strategy. So all we have to do is create a compelling quality offering that has considered its so societal and environmental impact, connect and speak authentically to a pre-existing tribe of customers. Create an engaging set of experiences that tie to that lifestyle and provide products and services that touch multiple touch points in a tribe's life while embracing the domination of Amazon and Omnichannel disruption. That's it. That's all we have to do. It's so easy. Introducing my company, Able. Okay. So what did I do here? In my pitch. Set the stage. Set the stage for a conversation. Describe a compelling problem that's happening, pervasive problem that's happening in the world that's disrupting detail that people need to consider. The way you created your own Product market fit, milkshake, right? So, a ve elevated performance tailoring and cultural lifestyle brand. Okay, urban sophisticated, affluent, well-appointed accessories, not to miss travel, elevated tailoring, 
and then we talk about rugby being the first tribe, why that is. I want you to see about the level of design we have. Um, I really focus on design. This is a perceptual map that talks about how we're differentiated in the marketplace. Something you do, uh, we do a whole class on this, um, you know, in terms of who our competition is. And so we go through this. Uh, we talk about clothes, we talk about accessories, we talk about the travel experiences, the clubhouse we'll be doing, the reading, rugby as art, full immersion retail, and 2% of our sales goes to bringing uh, rugby to um, uh, it, the inner city because no other sport is uh, as chivalrous, respectful, and uh, has sportsmanship like rugby. It's a please and thank you sport, and we think that the world needs more gentlemen. And so we're, we're bringing that to the world. Okay, so we'll, be, uh, we'll grow to become a go-to country club performance tailoring brand, and eventually we'll hit a lot of different sports, my team, operations, and then some stuff. So, okay, we don't have a ton of time for that, but I wanted to show it because this is a successful brand. And I want to contrast it to something I got in the mail, in the email, a few weeks ago. This was a pitch. I got an email referral by a, a friend, and they said, um, uh, this person wants to, to speak to you about a possible investment. And he said, please see my attached executive summary. <coughs> okay, so I opened it up and I got this. This is the, exact, the, the, the attached executive summary. Okay, so I just showed you a pitch deck. It was quite successful. This is their pitch deck. Okay, it says, I plan to build a single fashion brand that will sell everything to everyone. Everything in one's wardrobe, clothing, shoes, and accessories, everyone, all ages, all body shapes, uh, shapes, and both genders. Our target market is the world. We will not have a physical store. We'll have a single app. Okay? Not ba -ba 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 -ba. I'm looking for a high net worth investor to be the first investor in this fashion brand. I'm also looking for business partners, co-founders who are willing to work hard, think big, and dream big. So needless to say, I invested in this company. Right? <laughs> uh, just kidding. Um, but this is, this is a business pitch I got. For real. Okay? So in this MBA, we learn how to really convey value propositions and pitches in a, in a fundamentally different way. But I wanted to contrast that with another one, that real, another real pitch deck that happened back in 97. And this one was a Stanford email. It's found in the archives of Stanford. Okay? And this was a real email uh, by this uh, PhD student at Stanford. And it was uh, about this new technology this PhD person had, uh, the PhD candidate had, had developed for uh, browsers. And we're going to sell to Excite, uh, which is a, the, the browser at the time. Outlaying his costs in terms of this is what it costs five hundred thousand uh, dollars with faculty consulting, all their bandwidth and everything, um, and how there's a there's extreme benefits though costs five hundred thousand, but there's tremendous benefits to Excite in the first year. In fact, seven point oh three million total gain in the first year, and he broke it down, and so. Um, well, obviously, there's tremendous benefit to this browser to actually consider using this PhD's technology. And there are some hand scribbled notes by this guy named Vino on the side talking about um, some licensing fees. And uh, continuing <coughs> on the email, it said, here's the losses to Excite if the technology goes to competition. Okay? And so, 2.3 million potential total loss. So now it's seeing some clear value by actually considering it. And then I was like, here's my proposal. Okay, here's his pitch. All right? I work full time exclusively for Excite, a minimum of about seven months, seven months until August of 24th of that year. Why August 24th? Because uh, he goes to Burning Man. And uh, that's on August 25th. Okay? So he's going to continue consulting one day a week for a minimum of one year until August 24th, 98, because he has to go to Burning Man again. <laughs> and I can do this while still remaining a student, okay? And then there'd be some element of bonus. 
Okay? So, here's a possible compensation options. Cash, <coughs> stock, salary, which he preferred. He preferred to actually be an employee to Excite. Uh, or acquire a company which owns the technology, which this guy Vino thinks is a good idea. So Vino thinks that we should probably start a company for this. Um, and so what was this? Google. Yeah, who wrote this? Larry Page. Oops, wrong computer. This was the beginning of Google. Vino, as Vino Kalsla, the now super famous and very affluent uh, venture capitalist from the valley. So what did I show you before versus that? What's the difference? Huge difference. What? Huge difference. Well, huge difference because we know the outcomes. That, that, that was more about words. And the goal was the objective was not specific and nothing was when you put it, because it, it should be smart. So uh, specific, uh, measurable, attainable, um, realistic, and timely. Mm -hmm. So everything was planned in the, in the second one. But in the first one, it okay. was just I'll give you words that. and not realistic. Nothing was clear, and it was just more like a, I don't know. Blue sky. Yeah. Got it. Also, there is an alternative here about the conclusion and clarity about What's my job in that? How I will be contributing to that thing? Uh, the thing that you, you were talking about at the beginning, what, what will be my role? Yeah. Yeah, so there's clear clear rule there. The, po the point of bringing that up is that what's missing and what we learn when we go through programs like this is we acquire judgment. We acquire judgment so we can assess the potential of opportunities and we distill this decision-making criteria and strategy in such a way that we can actually make distinctions. But another lesson here is that that email could have been uh, by any PhD student around the world. Why was it successful in the Silicon Valley? And it was successful in Silicon Valley because they have an ecosystem of technology success. They have great business schools tied to great sources of financing with experienced mentors that come together. How do we replicate that at Souter School of Business? The Creative Destruction Lab. An ecosystem. We're creating a super cluster ecosystem here for the same kinds of thing. And that's the opportunity for business students in the context of that. You learn a language in business school. You learn to distill synthesize information in such a way that you acquire the judgment required to make decisions like that. And that's what we do, we do. Okay? So, I'm happy to answer questions. How much time do we have? Five minutes? All right. As could be about anything, it could be pitches, obviously. Uh, in a sample lecture such as this, when you have done none of the pre-reading, we can't get into the heart of it. We have to keep it at a certain high level. But when you have the opportunity to really jump into the pre-reading, the classroom experience is a lot more dynamic and there's a lot more, uh, it, it gets deep pretty quick. So what's missing in this uh, session that you will, you will uh, experience in the real MBA election? Okay, well, um, I, first of all, I would take more time. My, my, my classes are three hours for the topic. And so oftentimes the first hour uh, for Creative Destruction Lab is either a guest speaker or some element of, of conversation. And then we break up and we go into a, a lecture type and then we do a workshop inside. So that students are actually engaged in workshop. So they write on the board, whiteboards or you know, they, they do kind of in-class activity so that they, they actually learn the lessons. So from my financial modeling course, that's Monday night, uh, my students will be doing bottom-up versus top-down for the ventures that they are working in. So they will think, of how can I really assess the value or a revenue model and evaluation for my company from a bottom-up versus a top-down? And they'll be doing that in the class, and then they'll, they'll be presenting, and then there'll be a lot of conversation. It's way more dynamic. So I have two. Um, first, is there a lot of group work involved? In what? In the program? Um, yes. 
I was going to do that again, but I stopped. Yes, there's a lot of group work. This is business. I mean, business is a human, it's not a silent profession. Um, the advantage of coming to Souter School of Business is that we're the, one of the most multicultural uh, schools in the world. And we prepare you for real life around the world. So yes, a lot of group work uh, because you have to. Yeah. I uh, no. Uh, I think that um, if you want to get a lot out of this program, what you should come into it with is an understanding of yourself. Spend time now really understanding what you're passionate about, what you're great at, what you can be the best in the world at, what you love, uh, why you're here. What does your life look like in 10 years? Right? Take your age, add 10, what does your life look like if everything goes well? Great. How does the MBA help you get there? Right? How could you take out of the MBA the skills, knowledge, experience, effort, network, expertise, and credibility required to build that ideal life that you've created for yourself? If you don't understand yourself, you could be creating a career path for somebody who is not you. If you don't have a good understanding of self, you could be building a career path for what other people want for you. Not helpful. The more you understand yourself, the more you understand that if it's meant to be, it's up to me that ultimately I can create my success if I understand the context of how this MBA fits into my career. All right? If you don't, this is just a piece of paper on the wall. Right? You get to choose. You get to choose right now before you enter into this school how this MBA will benefit you. And if it's meant to be, it's up to me. You either let your life happen to you or you make your life happen. What do you choose? You get to choose. You don't choose, you let your life happen. That's not why you're sitting here. You're sitting here because you know you're capable of much more and you feel like you can make a difference and an impact. That's why you're here. And this program can help you. Or not, you choose. Is there anything on pitching to governments? Uh, I don't know. Are there anything pitching to governments? I don't teach that. Any government? Um, uh, there's one policy and government course. Of we can figure that out. Sorry, corporate governance or government? Government. I mean, I think that um, what I would suggest is so I think you get questions about uh, do we do a certain thing? Do we teach, you know, do we do any courses on the mining sector? Do we do anything in government? And what I always say is that we teach you business skills that can apply to any sector. So if you're an NGO, government, it doesn't matter. The same principles are still going to apply. They're sector agnostic. You can use them in anything you do. So we might not have a specific thing for your sector. We might not have a class on, you know, the telecommunications industry. But everything we teach you, you can definitely use in the telecommunications industry. Yeah, think of it as a language. We're teaching you a language called business. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of the things I've noticed uh, in management, pitching a venture capital, uh, a, a pitching a venture, uh, is the ability, the skills to quantify qualities. Uh, do we cover uh, that in the, in the MBA program? Or yeah, do we you certainly can. Yeah, you certainly can. You can do, uh, you can focus on accounting, you can focus on finance, you can focus on uh, business technology management. You can go over into specialties, but the, the, uh, the extent to which you want numbers, you can get numbers, okay? Um, and if you are engineer focused, if you're mathematically inclined, there's definitely that opportunity for you. Um, if you think about marketing, there's two ways to think about marketing. Marketing science versus marketing, uh, creative marketing. Right? One is more psychological, one is more statistical. Both very important. Well, we're part of the entrepreneurship division, but we, uh, we have majors. We have a lot of majors. That in it. And so because we have 50 ventures that start in the Creative Destruction Lab, all different kinds, we have 25 biomed tech or life sciences, and we have 25 general technology or general science, um, there's always a different kind of problem that needs to be solved. And the way the program works is every eight weeks, that venture is given three objectives they have to achieve. And so every eight weeks, the student has to help at least one of those objectives. So maybe one eight-week period, that objective might be a financial model, at which point we take a finance 
person and put them in. Maybe it's a market validation or uh, business prospecting, at which point we'd probably take a, a marketing student and put that in. So there's opportunities for all special specialties to, to join the Creative Instruction Lab as a student, for sure. Um, just a personal question. Going back to your, who do you want to be every day uh, question, as somebody who is um, a major player in two growing companies in Vancouver, what lessons did you take with you in uh, starting Oh, I took a lot of uh, lessons with me starting Edelhard um, because um, one is, uh, I'll talk about my marketing lesson because if you're part of one of the largest retail success stories in Canadian history called Lululemon and, um, and then you're also one of the um, less successful, maybe sort of not yet over as an experiment called Kit Nace, we learn like what works and what may not necessarily work. Um, and one of those things was connecting to a tribe. Um, if you think about how uh, Lululemon really attached to a tribe called yoga. And yoga, yogis had entrenched social infrastructures called yoga studios, where people would come together and, and have the gospel of yoga. And we helped create those and fund those and, and build those as an ecosystem. Uh, Kitnase didn't have that. Uh, Kitnase had a, a tribe called the creative class which was a kind of a fictional uh, tribe, and uh, and uh, it was a, not less, not yet fictional, but more contrived and forced, where there was no entrenched social infrastructure, and so getting people together to congregate to talk about, you know, the value systems of this brand and the merits of this brand and authentic matter was more contrived, uh, whereas Edelhard is a rugby-inspired brand, and if you talk to anybody who play rugby here. But yeah, so you know it's the best sport in the world, right? <laughs> right? Because if you ask any rugby player what the best sport in the world, they're going to go, it's rugby, right? Because that's what happens. All right? And so we're authentically connecting to that, and we're leveraging a tribe called rugby, the best sport in the world. That, that's what we learned. Okay, so we have two more questions. Okay. Sorry, mine's actually more interested in your, your business. So I have, you know, all my jobs, I've worn a suit every single day. I'm very interested in that, uh, that product you have, um, but do you think it's actually going to, like, is your target market really Canada, or is it the U.S., or is it actually the U.K. and Australia, or India, which have far big, well, sorry, not India, not big cricket, but um, that have far more rugby as the culture, like, I just don't see many Canadians getting that connection. That yeah, it's a good question. So, uh, rugby, you think of the 12 rugby fairing nations. Um, you know, the, the south of the equator, uh, the, you know, New Zealand, South Africa, and, and then the, the British Isles. If you think about that, of course, it's, um, the Six Nations is on right now, you know, it's, it's good rugby games on today. <laughs> so, why North America? Um, where was yoga invented? Mm -hmm. yeah. Ah, okay, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, last question. Pardon me? Will Edelhart ever branch out to uh, Will Edelhart? Edelhart branch it to women's suit? There's actually women wearing it right now. Um, will we get into it? Um, so the future of Edelhart is a customization and personalization program. So by the time our pop-ups start later this year, you'll walk in, you'll be body scanned in a 3D body scan, and you'll be told what your size is. Uh, maybe it's ready to wear, or maybe it's a custom suit that's delivered to your house in seven days. Um, and so that is the future. We could be monogrammed, different kinds of uh, uh, suiting to suit your, your needs, all in four-way stretch performance so that you can be super comfortable, of course. Um, and based on that platform, we can do women's wear, we could do school uniforms, we could do uh, plus size, we could do everything, uh, maybe under different banners, and not Edelhard. So we're still contemplating that. I just have one question. Oh, <laughs> cheaters. There's always one in every class. <laughs> Okay, so in the in the the professional MBA, the professional MBA we do we do uh, we have part time MBAs now, so yes okay. yes that's what the five eighty C is right now. I only have four MBAs left. They're the part timers, the professionals that are uh, continuing on with the program. My full timers graduated. No, no, we're done. No, no. All right, thank you everybody. Appreciate thank you. it.